reading is taken, can you hear me? It's taken from Romans chapter 8, verse 15 to 39. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave against, again to fear, but you received the spirit of but you receive the spirit of sense. <laughs> but you received a spirit of son, sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we were children, then we are heirs heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. The future glory. I consider that our present <coughs> sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not for its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pain of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the fruit, first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if he hopes for what we do not have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that grow words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with, the, with God's will. More than conquerors, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God for new, he also predestined to be confirmed, conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave his, him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those who God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness, or danger, or sword, as it is written. For your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, 
we are most more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, neither angels, nor demons, neither the presence, present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God's sovereign choice, I speak the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. I'm conscious. Confirms it in the Lord Holy, Lord, Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cast and cut off Christ and Lord from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption of son. Theirs is the glory. Uh, covenant. Um, thanks be to God for your word. Thank you, Lydia. That was beautifully read. So, Enrique, if you'd like to join us, let's pray for you. Father God, we just thank you for this godly lady, Lord. We just praise you for bringing her this morning and the message that you have placed on her heart. And we pray that it may be a blessing to her also. So we pray that your spirit would anoint her and bring power to the word which she will speak. May our own hearts be open and may we feast upon the word that we hear today and the week ahead. Amen. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for having me again. I think I was here in December. So um, uh, thank you, Dean, for your introduction as well. So my name is Ulrika, and um, we live in Luton with my husband and four teenagers. Um, one of them is with me today. Um, we normally worship at St. Mary's. Um, my daytime work is with an organization called The Feast, which is all about equipping young people to engage well with uh, people, uh, other young people from a different background or different faith or different ethnicity, different culture, helping young people to have the skill and the confidence to know how to do that well. Um, how do we engage well with difference? How do we learn to live well with difference? And actually, how do we become peacemakers in that way? So that's kind of my work. But I also um, uh, coordinate prayer for Luton. So that's probably the context in which most of you um, might have um, uh, heard about what we do. So uh, prayer for Luton, the heart really is how do we become people of prayer in Luton? How do we grow prayer in Luton? How do we pray together for our town, even if it isn't about coming to a meeting? So um, there are monthly meetings where people from different churches come and we just pray for our town. And actually, I could go on for a long time about the things that we've seen God do in Luton over the last few years and the things that we sense God will continue to do. It's very exciting. So if you ever want to come to a prayer for Luton meeting, um, I think I think the, the poster is usually up, so come. Um, but yeah, that's me. So um, I, <laughs> I was laughing inside when Dean was talking. It feels like you've read my notes. Well, I know you haven't, which means that... Um, so Wendy gave me the, uh, the free choice to talk about what to talk about today. And I really sensed God... Um, pushing on my heart to talk about perseverance and to talk about sonship. And then, you know, you arrive and you think, oh, no, what if, I've, like, what if it just doesn't resonate? And then <laughs> you, you talked, and I was like, okay, maybe, this is, maybe we're on the right track. So we'll see. So today I want to talk about perseverance, and I want to talk about sonship. Um, and I just wonder if there are people here this morning who just are really struggling it could be maybe health or finances or just the intense pressure at work that, that makes it very difficult. Um, maybe there are relationship um, struggles. Maybe you've had bereavement. Maybe you just heart, your heart just feels broken for whatever reason. And you are thinking, oh, I don't know how I'm going to carry on. I don't know if I can do it. Um, it feels to me that these days are quite... Um, 
difficult days for a lot of people. There seem to be a lot of people um, for whom things are just too much. It just feels too much. Um, not sure if we can do it. Not sure if we can carry on. Not sure how much longer we can keep going. I don't know if that's you this morning. Sometimes it feels like even the earth is struggling, you know, groaning. I love this uh, verse in, uh, where is it, verse 22. The whole creation is groaning for redemption, groaning for something to change. Um, feels like there's got to be so much more. When will this end, this kind of sense? I don't know if that's you this morning. Um, but somehow deep inside we know, we have this inkling that this isn't the end of the story. So whatever struggles we go through, we have deep inside, if we're really honest, we have this sense that this is not the end of the story. And the Bible speaks of that, doesn't it? From beginning to end, the Bible tells us we live in this matrix that is a, a broken matrix. This is not how it is meant to be. What we live today, what we see around us, even the world, the earth just kind of dying under you know, the stuff that's going on, this is not how it's meant to be. This is not what it was created for. And the Bible tells us that God created everything perfectly. We were designed for union with God, for oneness with God. That's quite weighty if you think about it. We were designed for union with God, and the New Testament talks so much about our union with Christ that kind of seals that. That was what we're meant to be, united with God, one with him, included into his circle of love. And everything, even creation, was frustrated in verse 20 when the knowledge of evil entered the world. We live in a world where we all know what evil is. I sometimes joke that, you know, I didn't have to tell my children how to be naughty. They knew it all by themselves. Um, we live in a world where all of us know what, what evil is. We experience it. We have it in our own hearts. We all have the capacity to do evil things. But we also have evil done against us, and we see it around. And that knowledge of evil that the Bible calls sin, that knowledge has infected us a bit like a fatal disease. And it causes our hearts to be sinful. And so we make choices that hurt other people. We make choices that hurt the, the earth. Uh, we make choices, or we are able to make choices, that draw us further and further and further away from oneness with God. And we live in a world where there is pain, and there is suffering, and there is abuse, and there is grief, and there is lust for power, and there is greed, and all of those things that damage us and that damage creation. And some of us are feeling the effect of that more than others. Some of us might be living in that space where you just feel the effects of this on a day-to-day -day basis. And we're thinking, how long, God, help us. I don't know how long I can keep going. Last week, um, we ran the race for life with hundreds of other people. Um, I used to be able to run the Race for Life quite easily. Um, if you don't know what the Race for Life is, it's for can um, cancer research, and you kind of run 5K, and people give you money for doing that for cancer research. Um, so we, just, we did that last week. Um, and so 10 years ago or 15 years ago, I, I, I did it, and it was fairly easy. You know, I could just do it. It's fine. I was 15 years younger. And now it's just much harder. <laughs> I realize I've got older. Um, and we decided to do it, and I realized that if I was going to do it, I was going to have to train. Um, and thankfully, my husband said, well, then we'll do it together. So, so, um, so we did. We did some training. We kind of ran, you know, you can do these programs, for couch to 5K kind of thing. And I have to admit, really admit, I never got to a point where I thought, well, this is great. I'm really enjoying this run. It was just hard work. It was a struggle. So, you know, you're running, and I just keep thinking, I just want to stop. I just want to stop. I can't do it. I just want to stop. I can't do it. And I had to change my thinking to, I'm not going to stop. I can do it. I'm not going to stop. I can do it. And that, that kind of changing your the thing that you tell yourself in your head. And it was actually really hard work. It was really painful. There was a couple of weeks where I don't know what I'd, it's probably that my muscles weren't used to it, but my legs were really hurting. Every time I ran, it was like something was biting at my, my um, uh, uh, shins and my calves. And it was just, and then my hips started hurting. I was like, oh, why am I doing this? I don't want to do this. This is too hard. I just couldn't, can we just not do it? But by this time, we'd said that they were, we were going to do it. 
And, um, you know, we've put our name down and, you know, you kind of just have to keep going, don't you? But we know, don't we, any athlete, any professional artist or baker or actor or anybody who's the master of their craft, anybody gets there by training, 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 persevering through the failures, not giving up, picking yourself up when you fall down and starting again and not giving up and keeping on going. That's how athletes get there, don't they? They, they're not born with the ability to do it. They get there by hard work and con, con, continuing and continuing. It made me think, you know, our motivation, the thing that motivates us, um, is going to be key in perseverance, isn't it? So my motivation for doing the 5K last week was we have lost some friends, really good friends, to cancer. And I thought this is something we can do um, for cancer research. But also, it's just sheer stubbornness. I jolly well can do it. My friend's done it. She did it like a few weeks ago. I jolly, I can. <laughs> you know, I'm not, not going to do it. Like, just that pig-headedness of, uh, I've decided I'm going to do it, and I'm going to do it. Um, and just, I guess, thinking I do need to do something to keep fit. Um, that was the motivation for doing that Race for Life last week. For an athlete, it might be the prize or the medal at the end. Um, for an artist, it might be, I don't know, putting, having your work in a gallery or, or something. What's the motivation to train and train and keep going and not to give up and to persevere? What is that? And what is our motivation for us, I wonder, when life gets really tough? Maybe we're in that place at the moment. What is it that keeps us going? And maybe it is that deep sense that we know this is not the end of the story. This is not the end of the story. The Bible assures us of that. Yes, we live in a matrix that is all messed up. We, we, we live with the effects of the knowledge of evil. But God has promised redemption. Because of Jesus, when we look at verse 23, we groan inwardly, eagerly waiting for our adoptions as sons. Because of Jesus, we get to be adopted sons and daughters. I'm just going to say son. We have a foretaste of what it is to be one with God. We, the, the New Testament speaks about being one with Christ, even now as we live in this matrix. We, are, we live in a, uh, in a time when the Holy Spirit in us draws us to the Father, and we are allowed to take time in his presence. We are allowed to do that because of Jesus we have a foretaste of what is coming. Um, I'm always amazed that we think one day we'll even get new bodies, like 1 Corinthians 15. I remember when the first time I kind of read that and thought, whoa, we actually get new. I'm not just going to be some spirit somewhere. We're getting new bodies in, in the age to come. One day the Bible tells us there will be a new heaven and there will be a new earth and there will be no more pain and there will be no more tears. God will wipe the tears away from our face. There will be no more groaning. There will be no more abuse, no more power struggles, no more greed, no more lust, nor, no more evil, no more death itself. The Bible tells us that because of Jesus, it is going to get fixed. Because of Jesus, there's a 100% guarantee that this is not the end of the story. What you're living through today is not the end of the story. And that is really, really good news. Because sometimes when things get tough, the only thing we have to cling on is hope. Hope isn't wishful thinking. Hope is much deeper than that. So when I was little, I used to hope that one day I would get married. It's a pipe dream, really, isn't it? You kind of wish maybe one day my prince will come or, you know, whatever. Um, you, it, it's based on flimsy wishes. It's not based on anything. It's just the kind of wish. That's not hope. That's wishful thinking. But when I did meet uh, my husband, well, who is now my husband, and I had an engagement ring, I could say, I hope I will be married next year, based on fa uh, evidence, based on something that has happened, based on, um, based on a real thing. It's no longer wishful thinking. I look at the engagement ring, and I know I will be married. That's my hope. Of course, lots of things can still happen. I could die, he could die, whatever. But the hope is, the assurance is, there will be a wedding, right? You recently got married. Um, so do you see the difference? Hope is not just, oh, I hope one day, I hope maybe it will be sunny tomorrow. 
it's not wishful thinking. It's based on something. And we have a hope. The Bible talks to us about the hope that we have, that this is not the end of the story. Our hope rests 100% on Jesus because through him, it is assured. What is coming is assured. Our redemption is assured. Our um, adoption of son, our oneness with God is assured. One day we will be with him the way it was designed to be at the beginning before everything got broken. This is really good news. I think this is really good news. I hope it's really good news to you as well. I love the story of Abraham. You know, he, you, you know the story. He wanted a son and he had no son. And um, he talks to God about it. And God says, now I'm going to give you a son. Nothing. No sign. Do you know how long he had to wait? 25 years. 25 years. God, you said I was going to have a son. I am going to give you a son. But there was no evidence. All Abraham could go on is God's promise. And Genesis 15 verse 6 tells us, Abraham believed the Lord. And that was credited to him as righteousness. And I wonder if there are some times when we just have to say, okay, God, I don't see the evidence for it yet, but I believe you. I believe what you're saying. Um, I feel like I've had to put that into practice quite a lot in the last um, couple of years. It's been um, actually really, really tough. Um, there was lots going on, lots of things not going right, lots of challenges, lots of, you know, what is going on? And actually, again, I was laughing in my heart, when you were talking about spiritual struggles, and a lot of what I was living in the last few years, I think, were spiritual struggles um, that I can't really put into words. I just know it was really, really tough, and it was like a battle all the time. Like, you would look at my life and think everything was fine, but it wasn't. It was just really, some, it was tough. And, um, you know, there were times where I think, God, what is going on? Do you not care? Do you not see? What, what is happening? And then reminding or being reminded that God says, I have got it. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. I will be with you. Peace I leave with you. Rest in my peace. And all I could do was say, God, okay. I believe you. Help. Help my own belief. But I believe you. I believe you. I choose to believe you that you say you will never leave me. That you've got it. That it's not going to spiral all out of control. That you've got it. And that you are with me. And that you love me. Yeah. I believe you. And it's that kind of faith, I think, is that Abraham was commended for. You know, that faith that says, um, I choose to believe against what I can see right now, I believe God anyway. Um, Ephesians talks t uh, uh, to us about uh, um, the shield of faith. You know, it's that kind of faith that can extinguish the arrows of the evil one when they come. The kind of, that's the kind of faith that um, when those arrows come, they don't have an effect on you. They can drop off. They can fall away. It's that kind of faith that can inspire perseverance. And I think worship in that, and again, you spoke to, about that, is so key in that time that I think, okay, this is what I see, but I choose to believe you. And worship is an overflow of our heart, isn't it? So I choose to believe, God, that you are good. Okay, I'm just going to praise you that you are good. And somehow the sting of the, the hard stuff that you go through, the sting of the struggles diminishes in worship, in real worship. I'm not talking about singing I'm talking about that overflow of your heart towards God. And um, when we choose to believe, this is who you are. I worship you for that. I might not see it, but I choose to worship. I believe you anyway. I believe you anyway. So then the question is, what do we choose to believe about God? Um, and I felt that I just needed to speak a couple of uh, minutes about sonship. Uh, read daughtership or childship into that. I'm just going to say sonship. Um, but our sonship is the fundamental, fundamental basis to our faith. So it's an absolute truth, verse 14 and 15, that we have received the spirit of sonship. And by that spirit, we cry, Abba, Father. That spirit testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. John 1 verse 12 says, we've got the right to be called children of God. 
And 1 John 3 verse 1, which is probably one of my favorite verses, talks about the love that the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And then it says, and that is what we are. We are children of God. You might not feel it, but the truth is you are children of God. Do we choose to believe that? I wonder if you dare to believe that. So I, many of us, I feel that we live in a kind of way that um, we look or we, we act as though God is more like a, a boss um, rather than a father. Maybe even quite a harsh boss. You know, it's like that older brother in the prodigal son where we're like, I've worked and worked and worked and how do you repay me? And it's that kind of, you know, what does God give us? We have worked so hard for him. That kind of attitude that says, actually, I'm seeing God more like a master than a loving father. So when bad stuff comes our way, then we blame God because sometimes we assume that that's God's way of punishing us or teaching us or disciplining us for something that we did or maybe a failure or whatever. And we try so hard to please him and we want his approval and we want to convince him to help our cause. And that kind of, that, that kind of attitude, I think, shows that we sometimes look at, as God to God as a kind of master, boss. And it's almost like we want our performance to be good, a bit like performance management at work. You know, we, we, want, to, we want to do the right thing so that God is pleased with us. I don't know if that resonates with anybody. The thing is, we are already 100% loved. Nothing, it says that here in verse in, in the last part of the word, nothing can change his love for us. He already loves us 100%. There's nothing you can do that will make God love you any more than he already does. And there's nothing that you can do that will make God love you any less than he already does. I think some of us find that really hard. We kind of get it in our heads and we hear it, but to get that in our hearts, um, why, why do we find that so hard? But that's the truth. He al- you are already 100% loved by God, and nothing, nothing can change that. Nothing. I grew up in a Christian family, so my mum and dad were missionaries in Indonesia, and so I was a missionary kid. And I always knew, you know, you get told God loves you, yet that's, you know, obviously that's part of our faith, isn't it? And I knew that, and I didn't disbelieve it, but it was only about 12 years ago when I had a really deep experience of God's love. And again, it was like you're reading my notes. It's that tasting, tasting God's goodness, tasting God's love. And for some reason, it wasn't just in my head, but somehow, all of a sudden, in my heart, I knew, I I tasted, it's like, how do you explain the taste of a strawberry? But, you know, I knew, whoa, God loves me. Not just in my head, but I just knew. And it changed everything. And I realized that God loves me not because of who I am, not because of what I do, but because he is love. Because that's who he is. It's not dependent on me or anything I do. It's because he is love. And that kind of taste changed everything. I did have to rethink quite a bit of theology in the light of that. And I did write a book, but that's a different story. (laughs) You can read it if you want. But I, I did have to rethink quite a lot of things because everything changed. It's almost like, you know, you get those uh, toys that you you change and you look through and a kaleidoscope thing and everything looks different. It was like that. Everything looked different when I suddenly got, whoa, I am loved by God and it's not dependent on what I do or who I am. It's because God is love. Whoa. And there's a song that says, one touch from the king changes everything. It really was like that. When the heart receives and understands and tastes, you are loved. You are children of God. He lavishes his love on us. You cannot change that no matter what you do. And so what we do changes because we no longer do things like, you know, being involved in church or, you know, the stuff that we do, praying, reading the Bible, all of these things that we kind of feel like we need to do. We no longer do them because we feel that we need God's approval or it's kind of part of our job because the boss might be cross if we don't. We do it from a different spirit because we realize we do it because there's this love and this partnership and there's, I do it because it's just, that's what we do as friends. 
not because I feel like I need to earn his love or his approval. It just changes how we do things. And I spent a year actually doing nothing. It felt like God said, just stop. Just I was involved in lots of things. I was doing children's stuff at, at church. And, and he, he was just like, just stop, take a break, don't do anything. But when I get, got back to it, it was from a different heart. It still looked the same to other people because, you know, what you, it's still what I did. But it was a different heart because I wasn't doing it because I was trying to somehow think, please, God, I hope you're pleased with me. But it's like, how do I love you? How do I love you back? Okay, I will do that thing. It's different. My oldest son is 18. Emma. I'm going to embarrass you now. But when he was born, and I don't know if other people have had this experience, when you first become a parent, um, I was overwhelmed by the passion and the love I felt for this human baby thing. It was surprised me. I never experienced anything like it before. How could I love another person this much? Like, all he does is poo and cry a lot <laughs> for about three months and sleep, and drink, and like, it's not like he's done anything to deserve my love, but why is it that I feel so passionate about this baby? Not because he's earned it in any way, but because he's mine, and because I love him. And so as they grow older, and you know, maybe do things that aren't so exciting, or aren't so, not so great, the love is still there. You might not like what they do, but the love is there because we've committed, committed because I love him. I think God is like that with us. God loves us. He might not always be pleased with what we do, but that doesn't change his love for us, and it doesn't change that we need to kind of earn his approval back. It's just he loves us, loves us, loves us, and I just wonder if there's some of us here today who need to just spend some time thinking more about sonship. Maybe we've acted like servants long enough. Maybe, you know, acting like servants can breed resentment. We can feel underpaid. We can feel tired maybe it's time to live like a beloved son. Yeah, live like a beloved. That's the one. And when you feel loved, you will love others in a very different way. Everything will be different. You will not be, you, ever, you will not act the same way because you know that you are loved. And if you've tasted it, you know what I'm talking about. So, God gives us the right to be children of God, and he lavishes his love on us. And when we remember that God loves us, then perseverance, when it's tough, gets just a little bit easier. Because we can say, okay, God, I believe you. I am your child. I am your child. Can I just pray for you? Father, thank you that you are our good Father and that you love us. And I want to pray for anybody here who maybe has never really tasted that, that there would be a hunger in our hearts to say, God, we just want to know you for who you are and that you'd reveal yourself to us and your love to us and that we would taste, really taste with our hearts what it is to be loved by you. And I pray that for... Anybody here today who might be in that place, who might just need a fresh touch of your love, that by your spirit you would do that. As we go into the summer months, maybe take some time to be in your presence and to rest and just to drink in your love and allow ourselves to receive that. Lord, I pray, would you touch our hearts again? And for anybody who is struggling, really having to persevere, Lord, Help us to fix our eyes on you. And even in the darkness, to realize what's true in the light is also true in the dark. And you are good. You are good. And we can worship you for that. Lord, thank you so much for the lovely people in this church and the things that you have in store for them. And just in this season of waiting, Lord, would you draw them into your presence and strengthen them Bless them, bless them with your love.